Hello, everyone, and welcome to another K6 Office Hours. I'm Nicole van der Hooven, and last minute, I have not not just one, but two other colleagues in, in today's show with me. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Hello, my name is Marie. I'm one of the DevRows here at K6. Hey, hey, my name is Ro. I'm a senior software engineer. I work on the XK6 Disruptor uh, team. Yeah, Ro is like one of those people like Cher or Madonna. No last name, no pronouns, <laughs> no title, just Ro. No, nothing. Two, two I, I, characters, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love it. It is unfortunately not available on many on many sites, so that creates some problems. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I can probably fix that. <laughs> <laughs> you can also share, you know, the fact that we only asked Ro to join us. Like what? Ten minutes ago before the live. Not started? even. It was five minutes. Yeah. Well, to be, to be specific, seven minutes forty-one seconds. Wow. <laughs> okay, I, Marie. Before we we get started with with today's topic, um, what's new in K Six Champions? Nice. So, um, it's it's so amazing because um. Our, you know, um, CTO, uh, Pavo, uh, he actually mentioned this during the company saying that he's just really pleased about the progress of the K6 Champions program because, you know, I think we're, you know, we're definitely growing. So we've accepted two more champions. Um, we have Ziv Calderon, um, who's an engineering uh, team lead base um, in Israel. And then we have Sahani Pereira, who's um, a senior quality engineer base in um, Colombo, um, Sri Lanka. So there's just, yeah, like so much love from the community. And, you know, we have like another application, like from, you know, someone who's done like a Udemy course. Uh, well, he's who's basically taught about K6 and he's basically um, applied to become a champion. So there's, you know, more applications going forward as well. But yeah, it's, you know, such an amazing progress um, and lots of activities as well from our um, K6 champions. Um, speaking of the XK6 disruptor, uh, maybe like I can share the um, article that one of our K6 champion, um, Yusuf um, Taiman, has you know shared with us. Um, I'll share it on the um, on the comment section. Um, but he's basically written like an introductory post on you know how. Grafana K6 can be used for fault injection testing, which is a great, you know, read. And we're going to be talking and demonstrating later how we can use XK6 Disruptor um, with, you know, other types of um, tests that we have um, here in K6. So if you haven't read the article, um, it's, it's a really great one. Yeah, well, thanks to the demo that Ro is going to give. <laughs> 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 no, no, no demo. <laughs> Yusuf Taman also wrote a blog post some time ago about the use of um, AI for K6, in particular GitHub Copilot. He's one of the mm -hmm. first to, to write about it. I think it was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So you mentioned our CTO, Pavel Suvala. Uh, he has, I think he's the one that's been the most, um, the most adamant that K6 is more like a Swiss army knife or a multi-tool rather than just a standalone unitasker. And I think the preconception is that K6 is a load testing tool, which isn't incorrect. It is, right? That's where it started. And that's still like the roots. But I guess what is when we when we step back and we think about the difference between something that does only one thing, like a standalone unit tasker versus a Swiss army knife or a multi-tool. So like screwdriver versus a multi-tool. Like what are the what do you two think are the pros and cons of each approach? Yeah, I think for me, like um the one of the main pro is you know, I can just use one tool for different use cases. Like, I love the idea of, you know, reusability and, you know, the extensionability as well, rather than me trying to look for 
oh, let me just look at my toolbox and see if I have that tool. And last time I looked at my toolbox, it was such a mess. So imagine like trying to find like different tools. Whereas if you just have a single tool, like a Swiss Army knife, um, you know, you don't really have to worry about like, if you forget like other tools, because you can just use like the different like functionalities of it. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of my main con, uh, my main pro. Sorry, what about you, Ro? Yeah, I also think it's pretty convenient, like to have everything uh, under the, under the reach uh, at the reach of your hand. And also, there is there is uh, like another benefit I would like to add, which is integration right like how this tool integrates together so uh, if uh, let's say you use k6 for load testing or for reliability testing like testing if your api works all right you don't necessarily need to stress it a lot to check if it works uh, all right just with k6 you can put a modest load and say hey is my api uh, meeting it as a low so you can use k6 for that and you could use like a different tool for chaos testing and you know, start uh, killing pods or, or injecting, uh, messing up with the, with the network. But uh, then you will be using like two different tools, right? And mm. that might be challenging to orchestrate, uh, especially on CICD environments, for example, it will be challenging to set up those tools and to synchronize the test, right? To start the mess and the disruption at the same time that you start checking the availability could be challenging. So another big pro for me is having those tools tightly integrated under the same, let's say, umbrella or, or mm -hmm. parent tool, if you may. Uh, that is makes it very easy to, to set up this, this kind of test and to synchronize them and to assert that everything is working as, as expected. Yeah. So it sounds like you are both pro multi tool. So I'm going to play devil's advocate, even though I actually also agree. And I'm going to say a con that I can think of. And that is something, this is something that a, I think a lot of engineers think about, which is why wouldn't I just choose the best tool for that mm -hmm. specific purpose and then prioritize tools that work well together? Yeah. The myself by by just choosing one tool that maybe doesn't do all of the things the best yeah. and in, instead of just choosing best in class for each this reminded me of a conversation i had with um leon i don't know if he's watching but hey leon <laughs> um so i mentioned to him that you know because we we have well we had an episode about schema testing with k6 um He's used PAC as well. I've used PAC. And in terms of contract testing, like PAC is, you know, the main player. Like they have really, you know, created um, a really like mature process, process mm -hmm. when it comes to contract testing. So one of his questions was, why would I use, you know, K6 for, you know, schema testing? And um like I'm getting it from his point of view that because there are, you know, better tools out there that are suited for, you know, that type of um like test. Cause I've I've used PAC as well um in the past. And this is why we made it clear on that schema testing episode that if you want to do a full blown contract testing, it's better to use other tools. Like I'm not advocating that you use, you know, K6 for that, because you might have a better use case if you use other tools. But if you want to try schema testing and you're already familiar with, you know, using K6 when you do your load test, then you can also try using it for other use cases. But this is where um, it's much better to define what your problem statement is, like what's the, you know, thing that you want to solve before jumping into deciding, oh, I'm going to just use this tool because this is what other people are using. Yeah, so maybe let's talk about why we would want to branch out. Like, why isn't it enough to just do load testing? Why can't we write an end-to-end -end load test, point it at the right server, and just, you know, start it? And then we'll see whatever, you just keep ramping up the load. Why, what other things would we need to measure or potentially test? Yeah. I think the main thing for me is because when we think about you know, load testing, it's most commonly done on the protocol layer, which is something that our users don't necessarily see. Um, 
you can, you know, um, record like a browser session, convert that to like a protocol level script, but then like that script might get really complicated, like, you know, really long. And imagine if, you know, there's like a small change um, on, you know, your web app, but then the change that you'll make as part of your protocol level script, it's much, you know, larger, it's much bigger. So I think it's good to expand to other types of testing, like with the browser, you know, performance, because it's much closer to, you know, the user experience. And I guess it simplifies like some of the, um, you know, stuff that I mentioned in terms of like having a long script, because if we convert that to um, a browser script, like let's say a login functionality, it's just really getting the elements of those field, typing your username, your password, and then clicking submit. Whereas if that's done on the protocol level, you might have to send like different like post requests, like all the headers must be there. So it can get quite complicated. Um, so I think, yeah, if, if, if we're talking about, you know, simplicity, much better developer experience as well. And, you know, making sure that we also cover, um, testing for the user experience, not just for, you know, the performance, then I think that's a good reason why we would want to branch out. Yeah, so it seems like we're talking about what makes a tool a site reliability testing tool. And the first one, as Marie mentioned, is that it tests multiple aspects of the site, not just, you know, the performance of the API endpoint or whatever components that, that you're hitting. Um, Ro, are there any other things that you can think of that that might also be useful to test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, something that is, uh, and, and if you want, I can introduce uh, about the, the topic of, of fault injection here. Uh, yeah. I think it is, yeah, I, I think it is something that is sometimes perhaps overlooked or something that is not uh, very present in the in the minds of uh, of developers and and i think it is like a missed opportunity right and and let me let me explain why um when you are a developer and you develop either a front-end application or you develop an api that happen to have like dependencies with other apis on the system right like you have your service for example i don't know listing recommendations for products on a web store and your service needs to know other products. So it will query other service. Okay, give me the list of products for this category, right? Something along those lines. So you are this developer and you develop this service and uh, you, you depend on this different service uh, for, for your service to work, right? And uh, you, you want to know something that is, is interesting uh, for, for the developer to know and that uh, the team might be asked for is to tell, okay, your service needs to perform well uh, it needs to respond within X milliseconds, or it needs to respond successfully to 99% of the of the request, something that uh, along those lines, right? This in, in SLE terminology are commonly referred as, as SLIs, and mm -hmm. even SLOs and, uh, and SLAs. So depending on where you put this, this uh, constraint, there are, you have the full spectrum there. So back back to what I was uh, saying. So you have these these requirements or or these things that you are aim, that you aim for, but uh, these do not depend only on you, right? You have this this service that you that you need to to contact to return uh, the data. So if this upper upstream service is very slow, you may not be meeting these targets, and it's not uh, something that you can control, right? Mm -hmm. So you may want to 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 do this to to run some tests and ensure okay what do I under which conditions of the upstream service can I meet my targets and that is something that could we do with with load testing right I could stress a lot the upstream service and that way uh, we make it uh, slower just because it has to process a lot of data but that is like taking a big detour right. We, because you are not really interested, you are not a developer of the upstream service. You are not really interested in making that upstream service, like in, in seeing how it behaves uh, under load. You are just interested in seeing what how your service performs when that upstream service is slow. So this is when fault injection uh, becomes very, very useful because uh, you can just, uh, in your environment, either staging, development, even production, if you're brave, 
you can like simulate this service taking whatever time you want and make your tests based mm -hmm. on that. And, and, and like if you were, you know, stressing the upstream service with pure load or if you were killing pods or messing with the network, that uh, th those those strategies work, but are not as predictable as injecting exactly the latency you want, right? So this makes uh, your your make, like gives you the possibility to make tests that are repeatable and that mm -hmm. allow you to to see how your service behaves. So this is, for example, one of the one of our main use cases that we believe the, the disruptor can can empower developers to to test. Yeah. yeah, so it also seems like a difference in attitude. It's it's a slight difference, but it's important, I think, because traditional testing is like, here's this environment, this is like the happy state for it. Let's see what we can introduce to it to see if it can, um, how it's going to respond to that stimulus. And the the th whole premise around that type of traditional testing is that there's an expected result and then you compare what actually happened with, with the expected result. But I think there's also like when we're getting into chaos, which I, I do want to ask you about, Tro, but the chaos testing mindset is fundamentally different because it starts with the premise that we're not actually going to know what's going to cause the environment to don't even we might not even know what acting up means we are trying to expect the unexpected but we also can't just i mean it says chaos in the name but we can't just like do all the things and then see what happens because that's not a very scientific experiment yeah. like like rose said we are trying to control some of the variables so that we know what happened and can more cleanly associate the, the effect to the cause. Um, but while we're on the subject, though, why calling it fault injection or disruption mm -hmm. and not chaos testing or chaos engineering? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's an interesting question. And I think the line can be a bit blurry sometimes or even depend on, on who you ask, right? But the, the, the whole concept of, of chaos uh, is, is a bit more like what you said, right? Like we are going to mess with the environment in, in certain ways that, that we control these ways, right? We control, we can delete pods and we know that we are deleting pods. It's not like we are randomly pushing buttons. We know what we are doing, but we don't exactly know what are going to be the consequences. For example, if we, you know, have a cluster of multiple nodes and we unplug a node from the network, we don't really know what are the what are going to be the consequences of this. Could be several things. Maybe our service is going to start performing uh, like worse because uh, before it has n replicas and now it has less replicas because the replicas that were on the node with pull the plug are not available. So that is something that can happen. Or maybe we may get some connections reset. Or maybe we may be we may get some five uh, xx errors because the load balancer cannot can no longer can uh, reach those those replicas in the node we plugged out we plugged out uh, so there, we are doing one specific thing but we don't really know what is going to happen and what uh, those things those things uh, can uh, which uh, which i said can happen uh, all of them can happen but some of them may happen in your development environment and if you do the same test on production or on staging maybe others can happen, right? It, it, it is the, the test itself, even if I'm doing the same thing, I'm plugging the, the plugging out a node, the consequences are dependent on this environment. So it is not, um, it, it, that this adds like friction uh, and makes testing difficult. How can a developer test this if they don't know if the result is going to be the same in a stage in some production? What are you really testing, right? So with fault injection, what we are doing is uh, we are simulating, or rather, some, some people say simulating, I'm not entirely sure simulating is the word. We are forcing this, uh, we are forcing very explicit things to happen. So mm -hmm. through fault injection, you do not say remove this node or reduce the replicas or make uh, cause more, more load on the service. With fault injection, you can say, make the service take longer to respond. And you do not care how, right? 
you, this mm-hmm. can happen again uh, in in many different scenarios. But uh, as a as a test engineer or as a developer, you do not care. You just want to test what happens when the upstream service is slower. So that's what you say: make the service slower, and then this will be portable across environments. The, the service will always be slower, and you you won't need to think a lot about how your your test applies to different environments. And like this with other things, you can say, make the service respond with 500 in 10% of the requests. And you don't need to do while guessing with the injecting loads or with the plugging out cables to figure out how you can make an upstream service that you know nothing about return 500. So you don't need to think about neither the environment nor about the implementation details of the upstream service. You can just make it do what you want, yeah. and that will be uh, what you what you are probably what you actually want to test. It sounds as well like you know with the XK6 disruptor, we're really trying to simplify the developer experience because um, from from what from what I've understood, like chaos testing in terms of like the tools out there, it's quite specialized it's harder like they have i guess higher um barrier to entry in terms of like getting started and like as a developer um the whole concept might be you know scary because you don't know a lot about you know how to use like different tools you just want to know what will happen if i you know suddenly just um inject like a delay or you know some error rate in this particular service how is that gonna impact my application like that's mm-hmm. just what you want to know you don't want to you know configure like a lot of things that you have to learn i don't know for how long so mm-hmm. it's 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 great cuz um i i actually started playing with xk6 disruptor um this week and um i've managed to you know create you know some fold injection like introduce delays and also reading uh yusuf's article like the documentation and and like everything um it's one of the i guess pro as well in terms of why using the same tool is a benefit because you know i i'm already familiar with k6 um and now i want to you know introduce fault injection so rather than me learning another tool i can just you know look at the API, I can, you know, um, inst- um, create the extension, build the binary with the XK6 disruptor, and voila, I can, you know, create a test. So I can definitely see that as a massive um, benefit. While, um, whereas if I choose another tool for, you know, fault injection testing, it might have taken me a longer time <laughs> for me to create <laughs> like a script that will simulate, you know, what will happen if there are some delays or some errors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so absolutely. we're already, we've been talking about how we can use K6 to do different types of tests entirely. So tests that maybe look at the user experience and you, we could use K6 browser. Also for fault injection, which we could use XK6 disruptor for. Another thing I think that makes a tool a site reliability tool for me would be how well it integrates with the observability stack. Because I think there are two different, two different parts of the same puzzle. I think a lot of people say, like, why do I need to do testing when I can just observe all the things in production? And the, re- the the answer is not that one is better than the other. The answer is that why don't you do both? You know, why don't you why don't you have like a pre-production environment if you can with some testing so that you can if you do it as early as possible, you can catch issues before they they actually are released. But also even in production, you can use testing. Um, and you the in in um other environments than production as well, right? But K6 excels at this because like we already have, we've talked about the um, the Prometheus remote write output as well. So, I mean, Prometheus is also something that, that Grafana Labs really works on and contributes to. There are people who are just working on Prometheus. And so, of course, K6 is going to be very uh, well integrated to, to that. Another thing is K6 uh, 
it's an experimental module now, but it is a way to hook up to Tempo. So I think that a lot of test tools don't really think of anything in the observability space, which is a real shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think this this uh, like uh, ability to to collect the data for your for your tests in addition to the instrumentation you may have on your service, right? You you have both, and then you can you can make uh, cool things and and extract cool information from very nice information from from that data. It's almost like bridging the gap between testing and ops. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I think that would make a tool a site reliability testing tool is if it isn't just testing, you know, API endpoints, which is most people's conception of a load test. That it's not it's not accurate because a load test can be more than just that, but K6 can also test like a database, you know. Um we can we have an ecosystem is a big part of this because you know there's like the the redis now experimental module um there's the the xk6 kubernetes one so if you have applications running on a cluster you can do that um you can there's also an integration with an extension for kafka so the fact that it can it can be it's almost like a swiss army knife if you could remove the things that are in the knife and then just like plug in whatever you want it's more like lego really <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe we need to say to Pavel it's yeah more of a lego tool rather than a swiss army knife <laughs> yeah um did you want to demo that that app marie yes oh my gosh let's do this demo <laughs> so what are we looking at here um, and why okay. does it make me hungry <laughs> <laughs> so, um so quick pizza um daniel if you're watching yeah kudos to you for creating this you know awesome application um but basically i think you know we we have a lot of i guess demo websites but I think it's more catered for, you know, protocol level, you know, type of test. So I think having this um, application where it's sort, it's more like realistic to what I guess someone would think as a web application, not just, you know, a very simple, you know, UI, but like with this one, for example, um, if you just, you know, click this button, this would give you like recommendations of, I guess, pizza, you know, that might be, I guess, a um, better option for, you know, next time. Or if you're just running out of ideas, then I think, yeah, this is like a handy, um, a handy way. Although I don't agree with this, cutting it with scissors. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this, this is certainly an opinionated tool, right? <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, there's, you know, advanced features um, to this app as well. So if you want to you know, have like a minimum number of, you know, toppings, you know, maximum number. And if it, you know, needs to be like vegetarian, then yeah, you can just get, you know, some recommendations easily. Um, so that's, you know, in terms of the app. So maybe I can just quickly demonstrate, you know, the, um, like the, the actual project. So um, I think the main sort of intention for this project is to, you know, have um, something that, you know, we can use when it comes to demo. So, for example, such as this one, or if you want to do, let's say, a workshop, or if you want to do, you know, a more of like an in-person talk where you want to demonstrate, I guess, how to use K6 in different ways. But at, but at the same time, if you, you know, are not too familiar yet uh, with K6, then you can, you know, have a look at, I guess, the different, um, like basic features, so things about, you know, setting up stages, like what the life cycle is when you um, think of like a K6 test. So it's just a, like an, an, an introductory way um, to, I guess, get someone familiarized with using K6. But um, at the same time, like, because especially in this um, office hours, we're talking about you know, how K6 has evolved from load testing to a site reliability testing tool. So um, in the future, like we want to have like deep dive um, tests. So for example, in this case, I only have 
um, a really basic, you know, um, um, K6 browser test. But like in the future, what if we want to show like advanced features or, you know, different, I guess, um, relatable like web scenarios that people want to automate using K6 browser, then at least we can add it into um, this repo. And then same thing with the disruptor. So um, I think like the basic use case for the disruptor test is if you, um, you know, want to um, introduce some, you know, fault in terms of like you have a protocol test and you want to see how that specific fault impacts like any of the metrics. If it, you know, if it has suddenly increased um, like the request, like the response times, you know, and so on. So um maybe what what I'll what I'll demonstrate now actually is because we're talking about you know um different ways on how we can use um k6 and I think one of the key concepts is you know this hybrid performance uh test. Um should we talk about what the hybrid performance test first before I do the demo? Sure. Oh, what do you think? Yeah. So okay, so to me, like a hybrid test is really um mix mixing and matching like certain types of tests and then getting a more holistic view of you know how that impacts you know your application's performance so a hybrid test could be let's say i have a browser test and then i have a um, protocol test at the same time so rather than driving um, most of my traffic via the browser, I'll just continue doing it on the protocol level. But at the same time, I want to have one or two users accessing it from the browser just to see if any of my protocol level tests in terms of the traffic, in terms of like the metrics, if any of that has an impact to what my users actually see. Or a hybrid test can also be, you know, like I said, a um a fault injection test um mixed with a protocol test or it could also be a fault injection test mixed with a browser test or it could be like all three of them combined um it's interesting cuz you know we like internally we had this discussion whether should we stick with hybrid performance tests or full stack uh performance tests um i you know maybe we can also like talk about like in terms of your views, like what is full stack and is that the same as hybrid performance tests? I kind of think I th I think it's different. I think when I think full stack test, I think of it as you're testing the entire stack of the application, but you're not necessarily doing different types of tests. Like mm -hmm. it could all be load on different components and technically you're going through the stack like you in the back end do it to the the database and you know the load balancer but it's still like load tests whereas i think you know i would actually question maybe we shouldn't say hybrid performance maybe we should say hybrid reliability test because it's not just performance you know it's yeah. not just um it, it might not just be speed it could be accessibility you know other that kind of broadens it, the, the definition to different types of tests. But what do you think, Ro? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have like a, a strong opinion on the on the terminology, uh, I think. Uh, you you are the experts here on, on, on this, but I do agree with what you just said, right? I, I think it makes sense uh, to specify that we are not just loath loading or load testing across the stack but uh, we are actually leveraging different like testing the full stack not necessarily load testing so it, this this makes uh, a lot of sense to me mm -hmm. awesome so yeah i guess for the actual demo so uh bear in mind like this might have some errors so like i said i only played around <laughs> with the xk6 disruptor that's why so, we have you <laughs> Like the panic that I'm, Nicole and I were experiencing before this stream was. Like, I'm, I'm your scapegoat, right? So, if something breaks, yeah. you can say, Hey, what Ro did here, you do? The, the, yeah, let's <laughs> get blame the sources for this and see your name here. 
Yeah. If I Marie and I just rage quit, it's because you broke something. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be alone on, on the stream. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the blame. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, so the first um, step, so let's just focus on the disruptor side. So again, in order to use the XK6 disruptor, you need to build, you know, the XK6 uh, disruptor extension. So I've already uh, done that. Um, if you're not sure how to build, you know, the custom binary, we have like excellent documentation um, on how to do it. Um, and like in this case, so there's, so I, I, I was um, reading about pods and services um, today because I'm not too well, you know, like familiar with some of the Kubernetes um, concept. But in this case, um, I'm only importing the service disruptor as opposed to a pod disruptor. And if my understanding is correct, like pods are like the simplest unit of, you know, mm -hmm. like you can have like multiple pods and then services are like, um, a combination of you know two or more pods or whatever so it it's like the overarching um container is that correct i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I think you got it i think you got it right so pods yeah. uh, are like uh, individual the individual units the individual replicas of your application yeah. right so you have your service and you typically want uh, if it, this is a high traffic or a high availability scenario you typically yeah. want several replicas right and a service is like uh, uh, the kubernetes way or the kubernetes abstraction for the collection of these uh, pods that are able to respond to traffic mm -hmm. so uh, so yeah exactly yeah and, and, mm -hmm. cool so in this case like let's not look at these scenarios yet um but basically um, what I have here is I have this function for uh, my disruptor and in here I'm just, you know, um, creating an instance of, you know, the service disruptor um, and I'm saying that, you know, um, because we have the um, Quick Pizza app deployed to a Kubernetes environment, so this is just defining, you know, what the label is, you know, for that application and then this particular um, check here is just checking that if, for example, there's no um, target, you know, for that, then it's just um, printing this nice error message because we need at least um, one target. And then the main um, method for actually injecting, uh, for doing the fault injection is inject HTTP faults. Um, I, I think there's also like other method for injecting faults for um, other like protocols. Um, am I correct or? Yes, that's correct. So currently we support HTTP and gRPC. So there yeah. are inject HTTP faults and inject uh, gRPC faults. Yeah. Uh, we we have on the roadmap uh, plans to uh, expand this this list of uh, protocols, mm -hmm. but for now we think that HTTP and gRPC are like a solid base to to get started with the yeah. to, for getting started with the tool. And I guess like one thing to say as well, so XK6 disruptor only works if your system is deployed to Kubernetes. So if it's like deployed somewhere, um, XK6 does the the agent can't really reach that yet so for now they'd have to deploy it to a kubernetes um cluster yes exactly oh. but i may i may add that uh, it works on development kubernetes environments so for example if you have a local environment with kind or with minikube or a staging environment uh, k6 uh, disruptor will work on on those nice okay um and then here so i'm just passing this um object here so um, I'm basically, you know, saying that I want to introduce like an average delay of one second um, to this service. And then at the same time, I also want to introduce an error rate of 10% and the error code that the service should return should be 500. So if I just have this disruptor test on its own, it's probably not going to give me, you know, the most value. So I need to you know, combine it with either a protocol test or, you know, with the browser test so that I can see, like, what's really happening if I introduce, you know, some fault in my system. So what I have here is I have another function for the browser test, um, but it's just, you know, checking this um, load and check, you know, function that's, um, you know, on a different class. And basically, it's just, you know, launching the browser. It's creating a new page. Um, it's going to the 
um, it's going to the quick pizza app and it's clicking, you know, the pizza please button. And it's just taking a screenshot and then just doing some basic check just to see that it has actually um, um, recommended, you know, some some pizzas. Um, so if Isn't I Isn't that the dream? Like, wouldn't you just want to have a pizza place button in real life and just be like, yeah, yeah pizza? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like really handy. Uh, yeah. We need to ship this into production, make it, uh, make <laughs> yeah. it our, our business model. We yeah. will personally <laughs> deliver the pizzas ordered by this app. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, um, where was I? Okay, so that's basically what this function is. Um, and then here, so using K6 um, scenario, you know, feature where we can um, execute, you know, uh, different like tests, like um, simultaneously. So I have one scenario for the disruptor, which is going to execute the disrupt function. And then at the same time, I have my browser test. So at the moment, it's just, you know, set to a constant view of one second, which will try to hit, you know, the application for about 10 seconds. But from what I understand, so we need to give some time for the X, for the XK6 disruptor agent to basically inject itself into the service. Um, so that's why I've added a start time delay of uh, 10 seconds because I want the uh, disruptor to do its magic, you know, so that to make sure that it's injected itself into the service before I can actually run my browser test. Is that correct, yes. uh, Ro? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Takes mm -hmm. a bit of time, especially the first time you run a test because yeah. it needs to, you know, download the image for the for the agent and that might take couple seconds depending on your on your network connection subsequent times it will be will be way faster will be faster yep and then here so um i i forgot to say this time so basically um we're just injecting the fault option so i've specified here for 20 seconds yeah so for yes. 20 seconds there will be the disruption occurring and then we want to see what will happen with our browser tests if we have you know this um this disruption happening at the same time so fingers crossed this demo works <laughs> <laughs> okay um so how can i move okay there you go probably easier so here make sure that um we export the environment variable because this is a browser test so here i've done k6 browser enabled into two um, disruptor K6. So I gave a different name for the K6 binary, which has the XK6 disruptor, but this could be whatever, you know, binary name, um, you have specified, but this basically has the binary, which contains, um, the XK6, the XK6 disruptor and then run and then run the test and, oh wait, I did not save it. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> yes. oh my the God. Effect. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh but let's just wait 20 seconds because i don't want to interrupt it in case um it doesn't work interrupting disruptors <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so you can okay well i guess it's a good way to demonstrate that yeah if you just run the disruptor without any other type of test like it doesn't really give you you know any value at all so the real value especially yeah now you that totally I... meant to do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> especially now that i save my test is this so there's a delay because remember i added the start time of 10 seconds so it will only start by then um my 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 browser test i meant and then yeah you could see here that like there is a slight delay as well so something is you know, not right. And if you remember, I've introduced an error rate um, and, and, and the error code should be 500 as well. So looking at my logs here, if I just go to my terminal, you could see that, yeah, the server responded with a status of 500. So that made sense as to why, you know, my browser was just blank. It, it did open the page, but it couldn't really um, interact with the web application. And it's expected that none of my web vital metrics were reported because like there's nothing you know to um, to report. Um, the iteration duration, so this is just the overall um, 
um, duration of the test. But at least here, you could see that, yep, if, if a certain service is returning 500 error, the user experience is that, yeah, your users won't really you know, be able to access the application. Um, if you want, um, I guess, a less, not less, but um, a different um, experiment. So what if you just introduce an average delay without, um, without sending any errors? Like you just want to see what the impact is in terms of like the web vital metrics then you can also do that easily. So let's see what's going to happen. So I, 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 I expect my application to load, but probably um, a bit slower mm -hmm. than usual. So let's wait. So it did load, but it was very slow. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess yeah. This so this was the issue. So this is why Nicole and I were like, oh, we need we need row here. <laughs> but um, this is this is one um issue where I was a bit confused as well because like you could see here that the disruptor is still uh going mm -hmm. on. So I think I'll 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 raise an issue um for this because the disruptor should have finished uh basically mm -hmm. yeah yeah we're we're well, constantly working working through this. Uh, my my hunt right now will be I'm going to 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 bet myself and <laughs> try to di diagnose this. Uh, I, I think it could be because the the sec the first iteration uh, like the browser engaged with the API when the disruption was already started, so everything was was normal. But the second was right when the disruption was was finishing. Mm. So there is uh, th there is a switch in there when we uh, the the disruptor uh, stops disrupting. Uh, connections that are still in flight needs to be closed so mm -hmm. perhaps during the during that switch uh, the 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 disruptor couldn't finish because it was still waiting for that for that connection to, yeah. to work so this is something still uh, this is definitely something we need to we need to look at yeah and i guess that's one of the reasons as well why this is still an extension um yes. and you know while we make this more stable then i'm guessing the longer you know like the future plan is to also have it as an experimental module mm -hmm. Ro, yeah, can you can you talk a little bit about how it actually works like how is the fault actually injected like in this case l let's say the not the delay but the the http5 is, is it intercepting the the traffic and then responding to it or is it forcing the application to respond itself or what's happening here mm -hmm. yeah so in, in order to make it you know like like as, as compatible with uh, with uh, as as much compatible as as possible uh, it's it's like the first thing you just said uh, the way the the way it works is when as as marie was also saying when you start uh, the test the the k6 uh, program k6 will deploy the the xk6 disruptor agent into the service that you are injecting faults into so in this example will be the the, the pizza the quick pizza service and uh, this this agent comes with a very small and, and tiny proxy that is uh, that is tasked to do this so what it will do is to redirect the traffic that will normally reach the application uh, like directly it will in inject uh, a redirection into the proxy and the proxy will then connect the application uh, transparently so clients don't notice that anything is going on they still connect to the same endpoint nothing nothing is happening but in reality the traffic is flowing through this small proxy that we have and in this proxy is where the magic happens right w once uh, the traffic is Flowing through the proxy, you can do uh, basically everything you want. You can return 500, you can just uh, sleep for one second and then forward the request and so on. So this is this is how we how we do it. Yeah. I, I was asking because um, I was struck by the similarities between this and what we mock 
something to to stub out a, a key component. Like for example, if you're testing, let's say an e-commerce site, you don't really want to go through the payment because that's usually handled by a third party provider. So what you do is you hook up a, like a, a stub for that payment mm -hmm. gateway so that it still responds, but you know, it's not actually processing stuff because mm -hmm. like it's a way to isolate the one component that you know belongs to you and that you're testing. Um, so I guess it's it is do that with something like Montebank JS. If you I don't know if you've you've played with that. Um, and Montebank has a way, so it also intercepts traffic, but it intercepts it according to conditions. And what I really mm -hmm. love is it can say not just you know to this endpoint, but like. I want to intercept all all requests that follow this regular expression pattern or has form data or 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 something in the body that is size or or above a certain size and then respond in this way. So like if it's less than this size then respond with a 200 if it's greater respond with a 500 or whatever. Um is that something that you could do with with XK6 disruptor. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned many things. So some of some of those <laughs> things, uh, yes. Some of those things, uh, maybe. Some of those things, I'm not so sure. So right <laughs> now, uh, today, we have uh, a, a very simple exclusion mechanism implemented. So let's say that you want to exclude some of the endpoints of the service you are disrupting. So that will be the upstream service. Or in case of the quick pits at the backend service, there is as there is there is only one. Then you can do that. You can say, hey, disrupt everything except this, this, and this. And that is uh, like a very baseline mechanism that can be can be used mm. to, to control this. We are planning to expand this uh, a bit more to add a bit more granularity, like to say, okay, disrupt only these endpoints and perhaps this plan disrupt only these methods. For example, only post request, but not get requests, something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, exactly as like you say, the, the, the rabbit hole you can get into is like uh, very, very deep, right? You can start doing many things. You can start uh, using regular expressions. You can start, uh, I don't know, checking the body, checking, checking these kind of things. Uh, we we want to be careful with that and to more or less limit our, uh, our scope to what uh, we think is going to be the most useful, because if you make the rabbit hole deeper and you go very deep into into this hole, then the API will grow will grow very complex, right? So, mm -hmm. for example, if you think how can I tell the disruptor to, you know, only disrupt traffics when the moon is full and the uh, the endpoint ends with a zero, right? So you, you will start, how, how do you tell this the disruptor? It will be a complex API with a very nested object or, you know, obscure regular expressions. And we really don't want to go down that path. We really mm -hmm. want this to, really want tests to be expressive, to be easy to write and easy to read. So in, in uh, to, to achieve this, uh, we want to keep uh, this this uh, this balance uh, just just right. But uh, this does not mean that we that we are that we are interested in feedback. Please tell us uh, if yeah. you try out the disruptor and you see, you know, I think it, it is not clicking for me because I miss this condition. Uh, please tell us, raise an issue, and and we will uh, discuss with you, see if the use case fits, and implement it if it is if it is possible. Right? The proxy can do mostly anything, so the the limiting factor here is how hard it will be to interact with it. So if you miss something, uh, please please tell us. Sorry, Marie, I I were you done with your demo? Um, just one thing that I want to just point out. So, um, like. For example, with the last example um, where I introduced, you know, a delay, um, you could also see that in terms of the different web vital metrics, like the first contentful paint, like largest contentful paint, that it's also, um, you know, increase in terms of like, you know, the duration. So I think before it was just like milliseconds and now like, if a certain service is, you know, disrupted, then that can also impact the user experience. And you'll be able to know if you just, you know, have a look at these different web vital uh, metrics. So in here, like average, you know, five, you know, seconds for the first and largest contentful paint. So, yep, this is, you know, um, like a great 
experiment because like what Rose said you can just use you know if you like use like the different um like options on how to inject faults um and it's great because you're just doing this locally you're not interrupting you know like the actual service you're not interrupting production so it gives you the freedom to you know try and experiment like a lot of faults and see what what will happen if you okay if i increase the response times or if i have different like status codes like error codes like what will happen in terms of you know my user experience so yeah really great i would love to end with some best practices for running this type of hybrid test um what are some things like general principles that you can think of either of you from like if someone wants to run a kind of multifaceted test with different scenarios, maybe testing different components and different test types, what would you recommend to them? I think having a clear goal and making sure that it links to your SLOs, like you're not just um, like blindingly you know adding like random numbers because then you want your test to be you know meaningful even though you're you know like um um even if you're doing this hybrid you know um performance test so definitely make it like goal specific um uh, make sure that each of your tests has actually a purpose um because i guess it's it's quite easy to you know just have like a mentality of okay i'll just have this checklist of things that I want and that covers, you know, my, my hybrid test. But what value is, is, the, is the test actually bringing? So I would make sure to link it back to, you know, what your SLOs are and, yeah, make sure that, they're, that they have a clear purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in that very same line, I, I, I would like to add uh, that the K6 overall like the, the whole k6 uh, toolkit and uh, also the disruptor in particular we we believe it's going to be very powerful it is very powerful for exactly for this right for slos and uh, i think it it is very interesting and uh, i would recommend every developer that has a service with with slos to first make a mental uh, a mental uh, exercise and think okay what what things what what uh, are your assumptions about your dependencies that might cause your SLO to to break, right? So if your if the service upstream is uh, suddenly taking ten times more than usual, what will happen to your SLO? So try to imagine this, and and if if you do so, and if you if you uh, happen to be developing in a microservice based architecture or in a particularly complex uh, environment, you will most likely realize that. There are many things that can affect your SLO that uh, may not be covered in your integration, your end-to-end -end test. So if that's the case, uh, I would recommend uh, you to, to give the disruptor a try and try to set it up in staging or in a local mini cube or whatever, and try to inject uh, your upstream service, 10 second latency or 10% error rate and see what happens to your SLO. Because uh, we see very, very often that uh, this kind of uh, you know transitory errors can cause uh, can cause you to burn your SLO budget and maybe wake you up at night because you are burning your SLO for uh, for something that is uh, that is not your fault. One thing that I would also say is get your prerequisites right. I wouldn't recommend that you know you have a fresh envi environment and you run like new scripts with multiple scenarios all at once. Thing. Um, I think you need to pay, you need to go back to the basics and do some functional shakeout. Like, is it when you go to the site, can, can you even access it? Just click around a little bit more. Um, if there are any severe functional defects, then it may not really be worthwhile to, to proceed further and do like a load test if even with a single user, things are already falling over. Um, I, I think that this comes back to what you were saying, Marie, where people just look at it as a checklist, like, okay, I ran a performance test. Yeah, but what did that actually do if there was a functional defect that stopped traffic from flowing downstream? Like, that's of limited use. But also, maybe I would say start with um, a small blast radius, like, like from chaos engineering principles, 
And if you have multiple scenarios, make sure that each one on its own can run and runs in a way that you expect. Treat it like a scientific experiment where if you add too many new variables at the same time, you're going to end up with a hodgepodge of results that Oh, any cool. one thing. Oh, sorry. What did I did I cut out for a bit? Yeah, <laughs> you're back now. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm saying just like the the importance of being able to keep the tests clean and making sure that you're building on a solid foundation instead of jumping off the deep end and just seeing what sticks. Yeah. Um, I think that that is pretty much it. Thank you, Ro, for oh for joining us. <laughs> Very impromptu. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> during the demo, it worked, sort of. <laughs> um, so we didn't actually get to blame you, which I'm a little disappointed by. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm happy about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, super, super happy to be here. Great. Thank you also all for watching. And I guess we'll see you next week. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.